So I hope everyone had a good uh, break. All right, and you've been refreshed, and you're ready for more. Okay, and more than that, I, I, I hope that you are ready to expect the Lord to do something. All right, each time we come under the teaching and preaching of God's word, uh, it, it was a little scary just now when Pastor talked about, you know, having more than one conference like this somewhere else. Okay. Reason is because I don't know how to reduce some of the things that we dealt with because uh, uh, the first uh, Saturday and Sunday and then uh, I think one of the messages on Monday, I don't have notes. Okay. So unless somebody... I don't know, transcri- listens to it, transcribes that down, or whatever. I, I have no idea what I said already. Aside from the text, all right, and the reference, uh, that's about it. And um, I, I've shared this before. There's a reason sometimes why I do that because um, in some of the preaching, I found that uh, the more I depend on the notes, actually, the more it's like chain sometimes. I'm, I'm tied to certain things and there is a danger sometimes that I become too dependent on my own, own thoughts, own preparation rather than where the Lord will lead me just through the text. Okay? So it makes it hard because it's not like a song. If you prepare the special, you can sing it 10, 20 times in different places. All right? uh, I'm used to that. And, and the danger sometimes is, as a preacher is that you become so dependent on that. You know exactly when someone is going to start crying but it is it's no longer sometimes a dependence on the Holy Spirit anymore okay so we're going to do a couple of things Uh, I'm just going to continue from where we left off just now for a while and then after that we maybe take a short break and then we'll settle in tonight with some uh, preaching and then uh, we'll wrap up tonight alright if that's all all right with everyone okay so we were just now we were in I think we were last in Acts chapter 5. Is it? No. Acts chapter 1. All right, Acts chapter 1, and then uh, we, we went from there. Okay, so let's just um, have a uh, okay, short word in prayer, and then we'll ask the Lord to help us begin this evening. Let's pray, Father. Thank you for uh, this time in the Word, and uh, we thank you for this conference, for uh, gathering even all your people that we can be here to, to do this. And Lord, I pray and ask that you help us right now that our hearts will be uh, attentive we are fully expecting you to do something to speak to us to deal with us and uh, Lord to just give us something that will build us up and strengthen us even as your church and uh, Lord uh, establish your truth I pray you will use me also as your instrument and as limited as I am and and, uh, as frail as I am Right, um, Lord, I, I just pray and ask for your mighty hand and power, and Lord, that you help us in this time. Lord, be with us, and we ask this in Christ's name, pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so let's turn to Acts chapter 5. Right, now we've been talking about the Lord using people, right, members of the New Testament church, officers of the New Testament church, uh, to be used to address issues and problems. Okay, and as we dealt with some of these lessons, we see here that. God needs, will intend to use everyone, all right, and that we are all co laborers, uh, we are, we're, you know, we're, and under the supervision of a master builder, all right, but there are other builders. And so the New Testament church is a place where each and every one of us, when we join, we roll up our sleeves and get to the work because we are all part of that group, part of that team. Right? And there's no one, uh, we don't elevate one person over the other, whether it's Paul, Apollos, or whoever. One plants, one waters, and then, but it is God that gives us the increase. Right? Uh, it is not one that is anything or the other. In fact, we're all nothing, but God is everything. Yeah. Right? Christ is everything. And so uh, we need to hunger for, uh, to be the kind of church where we want God to be the one doing the work. Right? We cooperate with Him. We are partners with him, but we have to be careful and wise to know when we ought to step aside to let him, let God be God, right, and we be His people. Okay, 
So there is a tendency here. Now, this still fits into the overall thought, beginning with 1 Corinthians chapter 1 onwards, where Paul established that there is no room for man, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Right? And so the things that happen are orchestrated by the Lord. Um, realize this, even problems that occur in the New Testament church. I've realized firsthand that God will work to surface up the right problem at the right time. Okay? If he's doing a work of refining his people and his, his churches, all right, there will be the time where certain issues uh, are dealt with. And uh, we saw that even that Paul addressed that, um, certain things he will set in order at a later time. Okay? And the Lord has a way of, by, in his own wisdom, to bring up certain things at the right time for us to deal with. Okay? So what I want to encourage everyone is this, that the, our mindset ought to be, if we see issues, we see problems, understand this is an opportunity for God to work. This is, not, this is an opportunity for us to come together to solve or to resolve issues. This is an opportunity of growth for the church. And there is a danger here that a church that is constantly trying to run away from problems is doomed to repeat that cycle over and over and over again. Okay? Now, I learned that firsthand uh, as a young pastor who had to deal with all this the hard way and then realizing that in our history that we had a pattern of actually trying to avoid problems instead of facing those issues. Why? Because nobody wants to. Right? It's very uncomfortable, very unpleasant sometimes, uh, especially when you have to deal with issues that um, involve the flesh. What happens? Once you see the flesh in all its glory, you're going to realize it's very ugly. Okay? But as we learn to address these together over the last, especially the last 12, 10, 12 years, uh, we learned and we grew and we matured as a church till we're now able in some, uh, in some of the issues that we've had to deal with in more recent years are uh, things that would have caused a whole bunch of people to leave or the pastor to quit, whatever, we went through. We dealt with those things. And in the process, we have become stronger. Okay? We had taken casualties, we had our wounds, but we have also recovered. And because of that now, we are stronger. All right, so let's look at some other examples of problems in the new, um, early New Testament church and to see how do we address that and how do the members of the church work together to, to deal with all this. All right, let's look at Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, and you see here that uh, verse 1 says, But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it. Right? So she, she knew what was going on right? and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, so here they brought this, um, they had kept back part of the price. Now they sold something, I don't know, maybe it's land or something, and they apparently they made some announcements to everyone that they were going to give all of it. Okay, now, they kept back part because it seemed like whatever they sold, they actually sold for more than they expected. So imagine if they, they were planning to sell it, uh, sell this, they thought they would get 100,000 and then they got 150,000 and it was like, oh, now what do we do? Now, here, I want to see that it's very interesting because Peter sense and knew something was wrong. Right? Verse 3 said, But Peter said, Anon, as why had God, uh, why had Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Okay? Now, I, I realized that when you, when God puts a man in the office of the pastor, right, as an elder of the church, there are certain there is a certain wisdom and insight that God will allow him here uh, in addition probably by the supernatural revelation of the Holy Spirit uh, Peter realized something was wrong okay Peter realized something was wrong now this is nothing really ultra special because many times I don't know if you realize mom and dad you sometimes have that ability so you know it was like hmm kids they're not telling me the whole story there's something else that's going on here all right, and, and here, 
What happened was this Peter, as an officer of the church right now, confronts Ananias. Well, that's so judgmental. Then why had Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Now, by the way, the, the lying is a very serious sin. Okay, but in our modern culture today, it has become so common and so normal that it that it's become normal. We have come to accept that. Oh, that by default, that's okay. All right, lying, deception, disguise, uh, you know, misleading people. All these things are forms of lying. One time we had to deal with the fact that uh, a missionary and his wife had been lying and, and, and misleading the supporting churches about, the, about things. And, you know, there were members that actually defended and said, oh, that's not lying. Anything that's not of the truth is lying. All right? And why is that so... Uh, such a big issue because if there is one sin that makes us as very like the f like the devil himself who is called what the father of lies is the sin of lying he says why had satan filled my heart but notice it wasn't just lying to the members it's to lie to the holy ghost now i believe this probably happened because they were following the leading of the Holy Spirit, the conviction of the Holy Spirit about what they should do, about selling their possession. But guess what? There was a change of heart. I want you to think about that for a while because I believe many of us are guilty. We make a commitment. We make a vow before God under the conviction of the Holy Spirit and then we take it back. How many of you walked down the aisle, made a decision, after that we walked it back, we took it back? God's not mocked. All right? He takes it very seriously. Here, Peter says, you know what, you lied to the Holy Ghost to keep back part of the price of the land. Now, was it about the amount? Because look at the next few verses. It was it remained, was it not thine own? All right? Is it, well, 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 it's there before you sold it, whatever, it's, it's yours. You can do anything you want. It's up to you. All right? And after it was sold, was it not thine, in thine own power? Even after selling it, you got the money, you can do anything you want with it. All right? So it's not about whether you give or you don't give. Okay? But this is why has thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Why? Because there was a, some form of announcement that the whole church knew about this. They, it looks like there was also the sin of pride because they were trying to be somebody that they're not. All right? They're trying to be seen, to, be, to have some sort of status uh, to be seen as very spiritual. And it says, Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. So, now, notice this. This is very serious because so many people think that Sunday is a day where we can cosplay. Where we can wear some sort of disguise, wear some sort of costume, role play, being a servant of God, a, mem a faithful church member, whatever. He says, you know what? You don't, it wasn't just lying to men. I said, you have light on, light on to God. That's pretty serious. Okay? But I want us to see here that as a member of the church and Peter as an elder of the church, you know, he confronted, he, he made a judgment, right, about a sin, about a problem here, directly with a member of the church. Now, what else do we see here? That, that was in keeping back part of this, very suddenly we, we see there is a, what, the sin of covetousness. Okay? Now, covetousness is not just about material things and money. Although that, uh, that happens a lot of times, covetousness, material things and money, it is even beyond that. Okay? Why? Because in the case, in the sin of covetousness, what I want us to realize here is that there, it begins with a dissatisfaction with God. Okay? A discontent concerning the will of God and His plan for us and what He wants us to have. Instead, what happens with covetousness is that we want what we want, not what God wants for us. Okay? And uh, I want us to see here that 
God dealt with Ananias and Sapphira about that. Now, if you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 13, look at verse 4 onwards. All right, it says, Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. All right, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Okay, so adulterers God will judge. What else? Those who go to harlots and prostitutes and all, and all that, uh, God will judge them. Now, the marriage bed is, undef is honorable. Whatever happens between a husband and wife, in their marriage bed, it's honorable. It's, it retains, marriage retains its purity between husband and wife throughout the marriage. And, it says, and the bed undefiled. Right? But look at the next verse because we're still keeping in context, right? Line upon line, precept upon precept. Now, look at the context here. It talks about marriage and then notice the connection straight away. It says, let your conversation be without covetousness. I wonder if you see a connection here. Covetousness with what? An, an adulterous heart. Covetousness with desiring material things and money. And in the... De in all this, you see an attempt to cover that up, to dignify it, to make it, to spiritualize this so that no, the other church members don't know. All right? It's linked to the sin of lying. Do you see a pattern? Because we see this in churches. Hmm? Here it says, let your conversation, the way we live our, okay, our way of life, be without covetousness. Notice, and be content with such things as ye have. Men, are you content with the wife that God has given you? Right, ladies, are you content with the husband that God has given you? Or are you thinking, well, if only he could be like brother so and so. He's so kind, so friendly. So thoughtful. And realize this, whether men or ladies, you know, you can fantasize and desire and covet somebody else. Here, you notice, there is a discontent. That's why the, command, the, the instruction here was, be content with such things as ye have. Whether it's the spouse that God has given to you or the things that God has allowed us to have. We're not content with that. We always want something more. We always want something that God did not allow us to have. Therefore he had said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. So here it says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I understand now understand this, God doesn't abandon us, doesn't forsake us. We can trust in Him that whatever we have, we have okay, and, whatever, and Paul said in whatever state he's in, is it there way to be content. Okay, but you will see that the sin of discontent and, and covetousness is there uh, in many aspects of life. Sometimes we're not content with this church. I'm not content with the way things are. If I, if it, if I were in charge, you know what, things would run differently. Okay, and, 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 and here we see that Peter had uh, addressed this issue with Ananias and guess what verse, back to Acts chapter 5 verse 5 and Ananias hearing these words fell down and gave up the ghost and great fear came on all them that heard these things alright and the young man arose wound him up and carried him up and buried him and they had a very quick funeral but notice the effect when God executed church discipline this is very serious because somebody died. Okay? The only comfort in this was knowing that when God deals with things that way, my comfort is that that person who died prematurely, that premature death was an assurance of his salvation. But it's going home in disgrace. Okay? It's being sent off from the basketball match halfway alright now you see covetousness they, by the way David was confronted by the prophet Nathan for the same thing it wasn't just 
adultery. God actually said, look, if you had wanted, if, if, if you didn't have enough, all right? He said, all you had to do was ask. He said, God said, I would have given it to you. I would have allowed it to you, but what happens? You had to take it into your own hands. You see the problem here? Okay, that this content comes where David, in his sin with Bathsheba, was that he chose to take things into his own hands to decide for himself because I'm not content God, with whatever you've given to me, I will decide. That's humanism right there. Okay? And you have to realize at the heart of that, that will, can translate into the way you and I make our decisions. Well, I don't like the situation. I don't, I'm not comfortable with the, with the way things are. So I'm going to decide for myself. I'm going to take things into my own hands to decide my fate and realize this. You are no different from David when you and I do that. No different from Ananias and Sapphira. Because there were a lot of ways that they could have done, handled this thing. Okay, it's not about the exact amount of money. It was the fact that they made a commitment to give all of it and then they, they, they tried to take it all back, they take part of it back. Now, we see later on that his wife came in, the same thing. Uh, and then Peter said unto her, verse 9, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. And then, then fell she down straight away, straight away at his feet and yielded up the ghost. And the young man came in and found her dead and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. What was the spiritual effect on the church? Look at verse 11. And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. Okay, there was an increased reverence and respect for God. Nobody took things lightly anymore. Okay, realize this. The business of a New Testament church is serious business. All right, it doesn't mean that we have no fun and no, or no joy. Okay, it's always fun, always joyful to be together, to come together. But we, whatever we are involved with is serious business. And here there was a great fear that came upon all the church. All right, and then outside of the church, people heard about these things. Okay, they were like, wow, okay, these guys don't play around. Okay, they're taking things for real and this is serious business. Now, because of that, there was a multiplication of the ministry and all that because look at the later verses. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people and they were all with one accord in Solomon's temple. You see the, the increased unity of the church. Through a crisis and through a problem, it actually brought the church together in, in greater than this, in one accord. All right? It says, and the rest... Of, and, and of the rest, verse 13, does no man join himself to them, but the people magnify them. Notice, God, in the eyes of the people, they magnify them, okay? The, the church, even though it may not, I, I don't know how large the church is, but it was like, wow, to, to the people looking at this, man, this thing, there's something happening here. But notice this, nobody, from that point on, nobody casually just joined the church. Pastor, how's that a good thing? Pastor, we allow all this stuff to happen, however, you know, it's going to chase everybody away. You know, all the visitors will run away. Look at the next verse. And the believers were the more added to the Lord. Multitudes, both of men and women. Now, what was the difference? There was a subtraction, I believe, and a reduction because the ones who were very casual were gone. Nobody dared to join. At the same time, the, you know what happens? The ones that were serious, there's a whole bunch of multitudes of men and women, right? They were added to the Lord. What happened now? The reduction was in the ones who in the first place weren't serious, probably not disciples, but there was a m multiplication of those who were committed and serious. The quality and the level of commitment actually increased. Okay? And now, when did this happen? 
through a time of trouble. You see that? It's happened through a time of trouble. Okay, we're not going to kind of deal with all this now. Let's move on to chapter 6 because we see something else in chapter 6. Another issue. Now, here was a church. Okay, we're not talking about the church in Corinth. Right? Everyone says, wow, that church is full of trouble, full of problems, whatever. But if you notice in the early chapters of the book of Acts, you're going to see that the church in Jerusalem went through issue after issue. Why? Because... All this is part and parcel of the life of a New Testament church. Setting things in order. Look at chapter 6 verse 1. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Okay, that was a problem that arose. It says here, uh, as the church was growing, the number of the disciples was what? It wasn't just added was multiplying so you're talking about a period of very explosive growth all right now with growth comes growth pains okay the administration of the administration side of that a church will be tested when they are stretched to the limits and here one issue arose now and you will notice this that as issues and problems arise the, there is a, the liberty of a New Testament church to deal with problems as they come. All right? And they address this by formulating new solutions. Here, it says, the number of the disciples was multiplied. Then, it says there was a division. There arose a murmuring, right? Imagine a grumbling, whining, whatever. Of who? The Grecians against the Hebrews. Now, these were not Greeks, but these were Jews who were Greek speaking. They were mostly primarily thinking like Greeks. Uh, they had embraced the culture, the language, but they're not Greeks, they're, they're Jews. Yeah. All right, and there, okay, you're talking about what? Two very culturally, very different mindsets. And what happens? There was a murmuring of one group against the other. That sounds like, you know, potential for a split right now why was that the case because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration now the widows were being ministered to by the pastors right they went from when gathered all them or whatever they went to them to serve tables to serve food to make sure that their needs were met. Okay, but there was a language barrier also. Okay, very often language and culture are very closely linked. And then there is a barrier. This affected the ability to minister effectively. Some felt it was unfair. Others perceived that maybe this was some form of discrimination. So what happens? You notice people don't bring the problem up. What do they do? <laughs> Weapons. There's grumbling on the ground. There's murmuring. Can you see why this is dangerous and destructive to a church? Because where we have the opportunity to openly communicate and feedback about a possible problem, about something that needs to be done, what people decided to do was talk among themselves. Okay, now, unfortunately, in the culture that we, church culture that we have today, the solution is you better not gossip and talk. Don't let me catch any of you murmuring and whatever. Now, that's not how we should deal with it. The pro if there is a problem, a problem needs to surface up so that we can fix it. You see what I'm saying here? But it's in our fallen human nature that we like to grumble or murmur about something. And now, the human tendency to do that sometimes has to do with the fact that people feel powerless. Okay, powerless to do something about it. So what do we do? Complain, complain, complain. Okay, my country, it's like a national sport, complaining, because people don't feel empowered to do something to fix it. 
most of the time people complain about the government, government because we always defer to the government to find solutions rather than to figure out what we can do. Okay? Now, I do believe one thing, and I, and I think I believe it's clear even in the context of Acts chapter 6 and 7, uh, 6, 7, and 8, all right, when you talk about the deacons of the church, whoever, that um, there is room for individual and personal initiative in coming about and dealing with problems and, and finding solutions. Okay, personally, I believe in empowering the members, right, to work together to f figure things out. And if someone can come up with, to me and say, okay, look, Pastor, there is a problem, whatever, but I think I figured out that we can do this, this, this. You know what my reply will be? Go ahead. Tell me what resources you need. Let's do it. All right? But usually, here's what we do, right, in the murmuring is that, what is the pastor doing? What are the men doing? What are all the leaders? Is it they're there? We put them there. Uh, uh, we voted for them, whatever, and they're useless. They don't do anything. With no idea of uh, the burden, the responsibility, and what are the things that are actually... Uh, being done now here as soon as they heard about this notice in verse 2, two so then the 12 called the multitude of, of the disciples unto them and said now there was a statement of the firstly what are the priorities right and what is the problem he said it is not reason in other words it's not reasonable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables okay it's not that the pastors or the elders of the church should not minister to people. But it's that we should not do this at the expense of the Word of God. Okay? So what was the proposed solution? Look at verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report. You see the spiritual criteria again? Seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost, right? Full of wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. So the solution was, okay, let's look for seven men of honest report, full of the, okay, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. Let's appoint them to do this. Dedicate them to this task so that we can dedicate ourselves to the Word of God. This is verse 4, but we will give ourselves continually, notice, to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. Now the ministry of the word, to be able to minister the word to others requires also a lot of preparation. And it has to be peppered with a lot of prayer. Okay? One of the, I, I think if, uh, frankly, the truth, and it's very, I think it's very hard for a lot of pastors, the truth is, if we do more praying and less, and less preaching, we probably will be more effective. Because why? There will be more power. All right, and we need that, okay? Now, now I don't know if you notice, this runs contrary, in fact, to the way we very often do ministry today because the, I, the concept today is what the pastor needs to go from here to there, run around, visit here, visit there, you know, do all this other stuff, everything except preparing to minister the Word of God. So what happens on Saturday night? Panic. There's no time to study. Google comes to the rescue. All right? You search wrong. Okay, what, what sermon can we do? Okay? These days, you don't have to Google because right, there's always a subscription service. US $29.95 a month or something, and then you get you know, a database of 20,000 sermons and then of, on every topic, and then you can just search, right? copy, paste, put it in, boom. Okay? Sunday morning, you're done. The illustrations are all in there. You pay a bit more for a premium service and you get all the slides also. The big name ones hire full-time staff to do that for them. Okay? Um, I'm pretty sure there are ghost writers. So some of you, if you're very good at writing it's, and, and, and you like to work on sermons, you, know, you could probably make a lot of money on the site. The more exclusive the service, probably the more, you know, the more expensive it is. You know? They serve only... 200, 300 pastors. I asked about this. Someone told me, oh, no, no pastor, you don't need Google. It says, it says, all they need to do is they love to attend conferences. Because at every conference, you just sit down there and you can walk away with 
about seven or eight outlines and you can go back and you preach that for a few weeks. <laughs> ah, now I know why. I thought people like conferences because there's free food. <laughs> okay, now, here they said we need to keep everyone. Now, I, I, I think this also has a philosophy, a ministry philosophy is this, keep everyone working, the, keep the main thing the main thing. If it's the pastors, then if the main thing is what? The ministry of word and in prayer, then let's keep them focused on that. And then, now, what about the rest of it? Now, let's pick seven men of honest report to do this other work. Now, we know this later on that they, these men became known as the first deacons of the New Testament church. Okay, let make sure that the deacons are able to take care of what? The physical needs that are there. Those needs don't go away unless we put people to deal with those needs. All right, those needs are there, but the spiritual needs and the, uh, with, with respect to the ministry of the Word of God, those needs are also there. So what was, where, how was the problem solved? Through specialization, all right? keeping people focused on what they need to be doing, right? and picking the right people to cover those things. All right, we see the, uh, now, so what happens? Verse 5, now you notice the participation of the members of the church in bringing about this solution. Because, and the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. Okay? Interestingly, every name there was was a Greek name. You see the grace? They didn't say, wow, you know what? We Hebrew speaking ones, we outnumber the Grecians by 10 to 1. I think, you know, our representation ought to be proportional or whatever. No, they said, okay, it's all right. All of them, let them be, okay? Uh, these are all Greek names. They can effectively minister to them. But there is a, you notice there is then evidence of the grace okay, among the members. This was a huge multitude, by the way. By that time, we're looking at, it was said that they were running at around forty to 60,000 members in Jerusalem. Right? That's, that's a nightmare. Okay. Now, verse 6, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. So they conferred the authority on these men. Now, what was the result? Verse 7 says, and the word of God increased. What happened? There was increase in the ministry of the word of God. Why? Because now they could focus on doing that. Okay. Now, so this is very essential because what happens that, I, and I mentioned this just now, that sometimes what happens that, the, when the pastor is not allowed to do the job of pastoring, why? Because he's busy playing Mr. Mum. Because the church was not able to adequately support the pastor. So what happens now? His wife has to find work somewhere. He has to be the driver. He has to be the babysitter. And he has no time to actually do what he's supposed to be doing. Now, I believe in a case like that, the church has a responsibility of helping to find solutions to deal with this. All right? Because here, the result was that the word of God increased, and because the word of God increased, notice, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. You see the number of people that got saved? All right? And these were real serious cases because they got saved, they became disciples, they were dedicate, dedicated their lives to following Christ, they were added to the church, right? And then it says, and to what extent? And the great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Now, these were, this, was, this group was pretty hardcore because many of them wanted Jesus dead previously. They were the ones among the priests, you know, and, and by the way, the among in the priesthood, a majority of them were considered their theological liberals. Now they were obedient to the faith. 
Wow. Can you imagine that? Okay. The these men that they put in place made a huge difference. Okay? But that only happened because now the elders were allowed to do their job and there were other men, deacons, to do the other jobs. Okay? Now when you look at the reality that we have today, it's reverse. Why? Because now you have a group of deacons to supervise the pastor in doing the deacon's job. Do you see a problem with that? Okay, because these men were picked, notice, for what? Their honest report, impeccable character, their integrity, right? Full of the Holy Ghost, full of wisdom. They are not picked because of their business experience, their business connections, their political connections, their financial know-how. And in the 1800s, I, 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 was, I, I remember years ago, I sat in a lesson about this, that in the, the churches in the 1800s uh, around Chicago, all that, the, the tendency was to look for men with business experience. And one thing led to another because the group of deacons eventually became a, like a board of deacons which was a substitute for or the church equivalent of the board of directors whose job was to supervise the CEO. Why? The, there was a cultural change because this came from the business world. Right? And the wisdom that of, that, of the business world came in into the church to change the way we do things. Now, some will say, oh, you know what? Our church, we have no problems. Why? Our church has no problems because we have no deacons. I think it's your cable over there. Or oh, he's stepping on the cable. Okay? Now, some even go so far as to... Now, remember, this was a... Under the leading of the Holy Spirit, the church in Jerusalem came to this solution. And then Paul further reinforced and laid set things in order and laid out very clear instructions as to the requirements of the deacons in 1st Timothy chapter 3. Okay? Now, what was the purpose of the reason? It was to free the pastor from waiting on tables. Okay? So, you see here that members of the church, all right, when they, they can be picked and appointed to help and be a, a blessing to your pastor, Okay, and to be a part of the solution, all right, and solve problems that, that existed. Now, this prevented a division and a split. Not only that, so if there is a need, this is how the need was met, and this is a, and we have a scriptural basis for this. Okay, now we said, but you know. Our experience has been, you know, when we appoint deacons and all that, they, they're always causing problems. Pick the right men. That's what the scripture gives the requirements. Keep to the requirements. All right, be discerning, be discriminating. Don't just put anybody there. Don't make someone a deacon because that person was not faithful in attendance and was not uh, you know, involved or whatever. Now we make him a deacon in order for him to become faithful. It doesn't work that way. Okay? 1 Timothy 3 tells us that these, first let them first be proven. Alright? Before you give them that office. So these are tested men. These are men who have been known to be faithful, to be working. But notice, they are, we pick the right people. All right, we don't. So the problem is this: you don't deal with a problem by going 180 degrees opposite into the in the other direction. It says, okay, there have been deacons who cause problems. Okay, let's not have deacons. Okay, if I were to apply the logic, then there have been pastors who have uh, caused a lot of problems. Let's not have pastors. The members who have, uh, have been creating a lot of problems. Let's not have members. I guarantee you, even if it's down to the pastor and his wife, there still will be problems in church. 
Okay? But the issue is, when problems exist, what do we do? We face them head on, we identify what the real problem is, and what do we do? We fix them, we find a solution. Now, an example of a wrong solution would have been this. It says, okay, um, you know, there was a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, right? Then the widows were neglected. You know, the 12 obviously cannot go around. There's simply not enough of them to go daily. And you know, when it comes to tables and food, there's breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Three times a day. Well, the 12 men are obviously not enough. Let's have more pastors to wait on tables. Can you see how that is a wrong solution? Right? Having more of the same doesn't solve the issue. Right? So what do we do? We have to identify what is the real problem. So a proper diagnosis allowed them to be able to deal with this and then find the right solution. Okay? So even coming to where we are today, the thing would be this. We have to make sure okay, we get the right men. Right men to be deacons, the right kind of men to be pastors. Otherwise, we're going to go the opposite direction in reacting to the problem. What do we do? We come up with man-made solutions, which is, well, let's not have deacons, let's not have pastors, let's not have members. The next couple of chapters, you're going to see one man alone, Stephen, was able to preach so powerfully that the Jews could not refute him. Okay, we're not talking about a pastor. But imagine someone, a deacon, a waiter in the church. Okay? Was proficient in the scriptures. You talk about this. In Matthew, uh, sorry, First Timothy chapter 3, right? Say, okay, pastors, pastors are one class, one group of servants in the church, right? They are rulers, they, they are also overseers, they are also the shepherds, right? But they are servants, ministers. And then you have the deacons who literally, that, that name describes a waiter. Do you realize when you compare the two offices, where do the members fit in between? Where do the members fit in between? The deacons are not afraid to wait on tables, to wipe tables, to mop the floor, to sweep, to do the cleaning, to do all that kind of stuff. These two lay the example for all the members of the church. All right? Now, can I say this? Examples are there to be followed. To be followed. It's modeled for everyone to follow. Okay? Now, let's turn to Acts chapter 8. We see one of the deacons, Philip, right? From verse 4. Now, persecution came on the church. Uh, it caused a scattering. Everyone went everywhere. Okay, and verse 4 says, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word after the death of Stephen. All right? Saul of Tarsus went totally crazy like a terrorist. He went, tried to break down every door, had men and women arrested and all that, and he said he made havoc of the church. Now, they went everywhere, they were scattered, but they didn't just scatter. They didn't notice even in moving from their home, the church members in Jerusalem, what were they doing? Because of persecution, they left Jerusalem, right? But you notice something, wherever they went, they went everywhere preaching the word. Wherever they went, guess what? It was still, there was still a ministry goal and purpose, even if they had to move. Okay? Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Okay, as a deacon of the church now, as it says, and the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Now, because of all the people that were uh, saved and, and the miracles that he performed, verse 8 tells us there was great joy in that city. Now, but verse 9 says, and there was a certain man called Simon, 
which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that he himself was some great one. All right, so here was a big shot, okay, but he was a sorcerer, witch doctor, but very famous. And people gave heed to him, they paid attention to him, they listened to him. He had power, he had influence. Now, verse 10 says, they gave, all gave heed from the least to the greatest. Even those that were rich and powerful in that city, nobody messed around with Simon. Why? Powerful, very influential. Saying, this man is the great power of God. Wow. So it says, and to him they had regard because of that long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. Okay? Now, so what happens? But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So a great number were saved. Then look at verse 13, because then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. So Simon became a member over there. All right? It says he believed also, he was baptized. Now, news go to Jerusalem, verse 14, and now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, and when they had were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. We'll skip over, verse 17 says, Then laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Verse 18, And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Now, saying to them, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. There is a term for this. Okay? It's called simony. It's based on Simon's name. Okay? It was a common uh, sin of corruption in the Roman Catholic Church during the Middle Ages. The rich and powerful could buy their way into the priesthood by offering money to be in a ministry to be able to accord uh, great honor, power, and influence by buying their way into office. Now, here Simon saw that, you know, being able to just lay hands, and he thought, okay, by being able to lay hands, other people can receive the Holy Ghost. He wanted to have that power. Why? Because people will respect him more. People will fear him. He will have influence all right, and he would get rich also. I mean, that money was an investment. Whatever he spent, he would make back a lot more. Look at Peter because, again, Peter, just like in Acts chapter 5, having the, dis okay, the Holy Spirit discernment says, Thy money perish with thee. You see that? Don't know if you realize, he got right into Simon's face and told him, look, you're lost. Thy money perish with thee. Because, now as talked about God, may be purchased with power. Now, we know the gift of God, it says, it is a gift, right? It says, but by grace are ye saved, true faith, and not of works, right? It is not of yourself, it's a gift of God. Okay, it's not something that you and I can buy. And he told him, because, because you thought that this, this gift, you could actually purchase it. There was some fundamental misunderstanding there on his part. It says, verse 21, he says, Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. Okay, he says, you don't have any part with us. You don't have any uh, you know, lot in this matter. For thy heart is not right in the sight of God. So he told him, Repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of thy heart may be forgiven thee. Right in his face. And he told him what? To repent.
Okay? So, verse 23 says, For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. He said, you know what, you don't have anything, you don't have any part to do with, any part with us. He may have been baptized, right? He may have thought that he believed. And you see here, actually, Peter just confronts him right in his face. Okay? Now, uh, what I want to see here is, okay, there was an issue, a problem here, which was addressed, but you notice with wisdom, discernment, and also the boldness to confront. Now, I think we've gone through enough examples. There are actually a few more that we can deal with, but I think we've seen enough to realize each and every one of us have a part to play. And you and I will have to choose. Are we going to be those that will get involved to be part of the solution? Or are we firstly going to run from problems? Okay? And whether as individuals or as members, we can run from problems. And some will go from one church to another without realizing the problems are sometimes very necessary for God to bring a, through a cycle and a process of refinement. Okay? Taking us through the storm so that we become a stronger and better church. Many times we make the mistake of trying to look for a heaven on earth right now which is not possible nor realistic. Each time you notice when they overcame this, right, what happened? Like in the case of the uh, appointing of the deacons in the church was that the word increased, the number of disciples multiplied, right? And then there was a growth in terms of the spread of the gospel, There was progress as a result. But the starting point for that was what? There was a problem. Okay? So what I want us to realize here is this. Have a problem-solving mindset. Okay? Be resolved that where a problem arises, what do we do? We surface it up, we communicate it, don't murmur, don't complain, but raise the alarm. Identify what the issue is. Now, we may have to sit down and analyze and say, what is the real problem? One of the things that I, I've had to deal with a, a lot was to help everyone identify what the real problem is because it is pointless to throw in all our resources and energy solving the wrong problem. Okay? Okay? And we've been through that a few times and nothing was addressed. And sometimes, yes, sometimes people have to learn the hard way. I hate that. You know why? We waste a lot of time. Okay? But understand this, we work together as the members, together with the elders, all right? And then later on, you see, together with the deacons, in doing so, everyone does what we are God has enabled us to do or has given us the spiritual gifts to do so that the church can make progress and grow in a way that we weren't able to before. Now let me challenge everyone because there may be some of us here, we've been kind of going with the idea that being a member of a church, you know what, it's something I do only on Sundays. Okay? Realize that as we are joined together, now Paul talked about the members who are joined into this body are like the bones, muscles, all the organs of a phys, uh, human body. Uh, we're all connected. You realize things will be difficult if some of your organs are missing? Hmm? I think some of us will have difficulty if one of lung is missing. But how many of us realize that if we are those parts, then what about members who are missing in action? Right? We need you. Amen. We need you. Sometimes, uh, what? Lord, 
but Pastor, me, what can I do? Well, it is the responsibility of every believer to identify, to seek out what is the will of God for my life, what are the spiritual gifts that God has given to me after I'm saved, so that in the context of Romans chapter 12, right, when I'm presenting my body a living sacrifice, and from then on, the spiritual gifts, using them in the local New Testament church, so that I can be of a help and blessing to the, my church, right, so that I can help build it up, and in so building up, it builds me up. Right? And so you can't afford to be missing. Okay? And of course, it is important that we have sufficient understanding and common sense to say, well, we all will work and labor and serve according to the grace that God has given each and every one of us. Okay? But when we do this and when the church and the members work together, notice something, they can face the problems and then be victorious all these things build us up all right um, they were not afraid to deal with the fact that like, in the case of Judas weapons as a one of the bishops who disqualified himself something had to be done after that even though he killed himself they had to remove him replace him they found someone Okay? But over and over again, there is this resolve that where these problems arise, what do we do? We address them. We don't avoid them. Okay? We don't deal with it by murmuring against one another. That sows discord and discontent and division. All right? So like I said, if all you are able to do is point out problems, you know, it doesn't take a genius to do that. But what we need most of all are people who can step up to be part of the solution, part of the team to build up our church. Okay? It's very obvious from Acts chapter 6, the pastors of the church cannot handle everything it's even worse when you do a study on the names or terms used for the pastor the bishop right the overseer in other words the um, what was the other one the shepherd or the pastor what was the other term the elder the one who rules do you realize that it's very rare to find one person who can do all, wear all three hats equally well at the same time. And in fact, it will seem, it will stand to reason that even when you look at uh, in Acts chapter 6, that there were, in fact, we, a lot of churches would actually need more than one pastor, yeah. more than one man, because right, one may be better in the administration, one may be better in the ministry of the word, and somebody else may be better in ruling because right, they know what needs to be done. Okay? Now, can I, can I be honest with everyone here? The, the one thing you don't want me to do is administration. I can do it provided I don't do anything else because it takes a lot out of me and it will drive me crazy. But I can do it. I can do it a good job also if need to. But it's just that I will become so obsessive about it, I have no time to think about anything else. There are a lot of people who are better able to handle that. Okay? In other words, here's a hint. If you know that your pastor is not good at something, ask yourself the question, can the Lord use me to compliment him? All right? Don't use that knowledge to complain about him. Because if you can see the problem, then my question is, could you be the one who can be the solution? Okay? Now, you don't want me to be doing the administration. Now, can I rule? Yes, I, I, a lot of times I know what needs to be done. The problem and then after that is I turn around, are there people that can help me get it done? Because if not, I have to scale back whatever plans until the 
we have the team or the people to execute that. Okay? Um, same thing. Right? To pastor, to care. Some of you here have the gift of mercy. Okay? And you can compliment your pastor on that. You know, maybe you can be the one to be the first to arrive at the hospital to be with someone because the, your pastor can't always be there instantaneously. He cannot teleport. Alright? But don't use that to say, you see, I'm always there first. He doesn't care. <laughs> be very, very careful about the spirit. Okay? Where God gives you an opportunity to minister, don't use that now against your pastor. Okay? It's very, very bad spirit. Realize this, we are all co-laborers. We, we need each other because why? Right, the role of the pastor is not to prove that he is the superman in the church. He does not have superhuman powers, right? He's not one of those Marvel superheroes or whatever. He's just an ordinary man who is just as weak and limited as you and I. And he needs help. That's why God gave him a wife. Now that's why there are members. That's why there are deacons. Can you see how we are all mutually dependent on each other? But keep him working on what he's supposed to be doing and then relieve him of the things that he doesn't need to work on so that we can all move ahead a lot faster and more efficiently and be more effective at what we do. All right? So as we close here, I just want to lay this thought, right? I want you to consider what to ask this question, Lord, what can I do? But before you can, but you see, before you and I can ask that question, there is more basic question. Have you made yourself available? Hmm? Have you offered yourself such that you can ask the question, Lord, I'm available you decide for me what I should do. Wait, wait. For some of you tonight, it's where I should be. Right? And for some, maybe you've never taken that step before. Maybe it's time for you to do so. Hmm? Because, in other words, there is a empty chair and a missing slot somewhere that has your name on it and, and until you fill that space okay as a church this church is missing something it's waiting for you right will you take up that place tonight commit yourself say I know my pastor has limitations alright I don't know what I can do maybe what I sh can do is I should go and ask him Pastor, what do you need? Tell me. Right? Maybe the Lord will lay it on your heart that there are things that you can help relieve Him. Then do so. Okay? Take a step forward. Alright? But if you can see a problem and you can see there is an issue, don't stop there. Go beyond that. What is the possible solution? How can we deal with this how can we improve it and then bring it up right bring it up so that we this church can be a better one a more effective one why for the glory of God Amen. okay let's pray Father we thank you Lord for even this time the word for being with us and uh, for challenging